Rick Perry was the 47th governor of the state of Texas. He served four consecutive terms from 2000 to 2015. He's the longest serving governor in Texas history, and he presided over some of the longest periods of economic growth and job creation in the country. Uh, they say that things are bigger in Texas. Well, let's show the governor that in New Hampshire, we can give a Texas-sized welcome. Please join me in welcoming Governor Rick Perry. Thank you all. We were in here last night with the U.S. Army Association, so I think y'all have them. I'm, I'm not going to tell the Army, but y'all uh, out cheered them. So uh, we um, we had a fabulous event in here and got to share with some real heroes of this country last night. You think back about this country, you think about the people who truly were some extraordinary individuals in America. President Lincoln obviously comes to mind. He had a quote that he said once, he said, while the people retain their virtue and vigilance, no administration by any extreme of wickedness and folly can be seriously injure the government in the short space of four years. Obviously, he didn't know about the Obama administration. <laughs> Another one of his Illinois natives. But the fact is, in 2014, the American people, they did exercise a little vigilance, if you will. They uh, actually it was the first time that we had the opportunity for the American people to make an informed judgment on the Obama years. And it was then, and only then, that they began to understand what ending the war um, in Iraq really meant, what the impact of that was for our country, for the world. It was then they saw the consequences of the empty words toward that dictator in Syria, the red line that was drawn. It was then that we witnessed the Russian president as he annexed Crimea the orchestrator of these policies that we have seen that I just mentioned will most likely be the Democrat nominee for president. She's the one that literally brought the reset button to the Kremlin to reestablish those new relationships with uh, Russia. Well, they did reset us, that's for sure. They reset us back to pre-1989 from my perspective. The American people saw all of this. They saw the weakness abroad. They saw lies about Obamacare. They saw the scandal with the VA. They saw the IRS looking into your records. The swap of a military deserter for five terrorists. And we saw a crazy man walk into the front of the White House and nobody seemed to know where he came from. Now, I'm talking about the crazy man that walked through <laughs> that wasn't supposed to be there, okay? Don't get, no, somebody will take that wrong. But they said, I mean, the American people saw all of that, and in November of last year, they said, that's enough. But just because they rejected the Obama administration doesn't mean that they're embracing Republicans. Basically, what they said in November was, we're going to give you another chance to govern to the Republican Party. And I'm here to say that a congressional majority is a terrible thing to waste. <laughs> Two things are abundantly clear to me. One, America is at a time of testing and our leaders are failing the test. And number two, in response to the many crises that we are seeing around the world, that we're experiencing in, in the world today, both at home and abroad, I might add, the conservative movement must be the agent of reform. 
There is something wrong when the Dow Jones is at record high, but businesses on Main Street are struggling just to get along. Since when did capitalism involve the elimination of moral hazard for the biggest banks while regulations are literally strangling our community banks? As a boy who grew up in a, in a community called Paint Creek, a place that, well, until I got to be the governor, it wasn't on the map. I tell people, I said, one of my first acts as governor was to call the text dot guys and say, I want right here on Farnham Market Road 618, a little dot, Paint Creek. But that unincorporated place that those communities relied upon those small banks for the loans that kept the agriculture producers going. There's something wrong when we're told the economy is growing, yet one in American is either out of work, underemployed, or is just completely given up looking for a job. Washington's answer to the middle class has all too often been, let's just spend more money. Liberals in Washington have spent 30 years criticizing Reaganomics while delivering what I refer to as trickle-down liberalism. Their view is clear. Give more power and money to the federal government. Let the liberals, the elites as I refer to them, take care of uh, their pet causes, leaving an ever-shrinking pie to the middle class of America. Their answer to jobs is spend close to a trillion dollars on stimulus, wash that money through the bureaucracy, and hopefully a few jobs will get created somewhere along the way. It is no wonder that Washington is now the richest metropolitan area in America. <laughs> Not because they create wealth, but because they redistribute it. We have to ask ourselves, when did the accountability in America work from the bottom up instead of from the top down? Where these large corporations don't pay taxes and single moms working two jobs have to. We're not going to fix Washington by electing a president who is from Washington, of Washington, or for that matter, for Washington. Change is only going to come from the outside, from my perspective, and so should the next president. There is nothing wrong in America today that can't be fixed with new leadership. I believe that with all my heart. I think we're only a few good decisions away. We're only a few good decisions away, and a leadership change at the top, <laughs> from the best days this country's ever seen, from reviving this economy, rebuilding our military, restoring our place in the world. And I happen to think we can start with our tax code. We have the highest corporate tax rate in the Western world. We need to lower it. Corporate taxes reform, we know what happens. The economists tell us. You lower the corporate tax rate, 10% and mid-level jobs go up 5 to 10%. Every blue-collar worker in this country ought to be standing up and saying, I'm for the Republicans because they're going to lower the corporate tax rate so I see my wages go up. That's what this story ought to be about by the Republican Party as we go across this country. We need to repeal every one of those perverse incentives that keep people from working. I happen to think one of the many flaws of Obamacare is that it causes employers to move people from full-time jobs to part-time jobs to avoid a massive tax insurance cost. Repeal it. I mean, it's, it, it's easy enough to figure this one out. Eric, we're going to put it back in your hands. We're going to put it back in the New Hampshire legislature hands. I trust governors and legislatures to figure out how to deliver health care a whole lot better than I do a bureaucrat in Washington, D.C. <laughs> Come to think of it, I trust governors and legislatures all across this country more than I do bureaucrats. How in the world how in the world are we ever going to really make progress in this country when we allow federal bureaucrats to decide what the curriculum is going to be in the states? I will suggest to you that the whole concept of Common Core is just like Obamacare. A bureaucrat in Washington, D.C. to sit there and decide what is going to be the right curriculum. That is nonsense. You're either for the Tenth Amendment or you're not. You're either for governors. We're sitting in the White House. I believe in 2014, and Bobby Jindal, who I admire greatly, an incredibly smart and bright 
governor, asked the president, he said, Mr. President, what do you think about how can we get flexibility to allow for the states to be able to have those dollars and come up with the ways to deliver health care? And the president looked at him and basically said, I don't trust governors and legislatures to deliver health care. That's the mentality that we're up against. And that's the reason we've got to share with the American people that there is hope for the future, that the best days are ahead of us in this country. Absolutely the best days in America. And I will suggest to you not only that tax policy, but also connecting it to energy policy in this country. I was incredibly frustrated. I was upset when the president vetoed that XL pipeline. Because what he said was, America's, America is not going to be energy secure. He allowed a small sliver of his, of, of, of his political base to make a decision that I'll suggest to you was terrible for the rest of this country. I happen to believe in a, in a North American energy strategy, a strategy that Canada, the United States, and Mexico working together, where we can be a secure region of the world. There are more known reserves in that area of the world than there is in Russia and Saudi Arabia. And we need to be using it. We need to be opening up all of those energy resources. Have this country, have this region, relying upon North American energy. You couple that with corporate tax policy that lowers that corporate rate, and here's the result. You'll drive down energy costs. You'll see electricity become incredibly viable as that power source. You couple that with a corporate tax policy that will give incentives to bring manufacturing back in this country, and the greatest days of America feel are in front of us. They're not behind us. That is the future of this country. That type of thoughtful policy that gives incentives, that invigorates the middle class, that gives them opportunities. When I think about what's happening in America, I know that there's, and I see that pessimism, but the best days can be ahead of us in this country. And I see that same pessimism as we go around the world as we see our allies questioning whether America is going to be there. You as a citizen, you open up the newspaper, you turn on the TV, you flip on the radio, you grab your device. You see individuals being led to a beach in Libya and be beheaded. You see a young Jordanian pilot burned alive in front of us. You see these young Christian college kids that are murdered. And there's, there's pessimism in the world. And we think back and we look at Libya and we see what happened in Libya. We see Egypt. We think about our best friend and, and most reliable partner, the most vibrant democracy in the Middle East, treated the way Israel has been treated. We think about Syria. And we realize that we missed an incredible opportunity to stop ISIS and its tracks in Syria early by funding the Syrian rebels. And we could have gotten rid of Assad as well, I will suggest to you, but our president stood back. And then they left ISIS and went into northern Iraq. And at that particular point in time, I will suggest to you, had the Americans delivered lethal weapons to those Peshmerga fighters in northern Kurdistan, that they would have stopped ISIS. They were fighting for their country. They are fighting for their family but we didn't. And today ISIS controls a greater part of that region of the world than the entirety of the size of the United Kingdom. And while all of that was going on, there was somebody watching. Vladimir Putin was watching. And he realized that Crimea wasn't going to be a problem to annex. He realized that he could adventure into the Ukraine. Now there's pessimism in the world as people look at the United States and wonder, what are we doing? There's pessimism in the, in, the, in the world as we look at Iran. And we look at this negotiation that's supposedly going on that's with a country that is responsible for Marines being killed in Beirut, a country that's responsible for weapons that went into Iraq and killed our young men and women, a country that still exports terrorism to Hezbollah and Hamas. 
There's pessimism in the world. But it doesn't have to be that way. Just as I think the best days are ahead of us in this country with the right policies put into place, very quickly can we see that same type of change in the world. I, I remind people, I said, look back to 1979. There was pessimism in, in this country, and there was pessimism in the world. Think about what you, what you saw in 1979, those of you that are of, of that age. You saw not only our wheat being embargoed, going and being sold to, to Russia, but our kids didn't get to go compete in, the, in one of the great events of the world, to, to the Moscow Olympics. We saw a debacle in the sands of Iran. The world was really pessimistic at that particular point in time. America, 20% interest rates. This was a brutal period of time in America from my perspective. I was just trying to get started farming. That's what we were facing. But you fast forward 10 years to 1989 and we saw the Berlin Wall fall, the end of Soviet communism because we had rebuilt our military and a president had the vision to rebuild this country. And we can do that again. This is an incredibly, an incredibly resilient country. We've lived through a civil war. We've lived through two world wars. We've lived through a Great Depression. And we lived through Jimmy Carter. We'll live through Barack Obama. I promise you. We will do this. I'm, I'm, I am optimistic about the future of this country. I am. I know what is possible. I know what's possible partly because I've had the great privilege over the last 14 years to govern a state that has been able to do some extraordinary things during that period of time. I mean, when you think about what has occurred in this country. From, from December of 07 through December of 14, 1.5 million jobs were created in my home state. The rest of the country lost 400,000 jobs. We saw 5.6 million people added to the population rolls. And during that same period of time, we were about 27th in the nation in high school graduation rates in 2002, 2003. By 2013, we had second highest graduation rates in America. That's what you can do when you free people from overtaxation, overregulation, over litigation. Americans will respond and they'll respond in a powerful way. That's our opportunity. It's in front of us. We're just a few good decisions and a leadership change at the top from the best days this country has ever seen. Ronald Reagan understood it when he said, when America is stronger, the world is safer. And that is exactly what we're facing today leadership that understands that the faith that they have in the American people is real. And that the sacrifices that have been made for us are powerful. When I walk off this stage, I'm going to go directly to the airport and fly home to celebrate my father's 90th birthday. And I want to share with you, in 2000, I took him back to his old air base in East Anglia. He was a 19-year-old air crewman on a B-17. He was a tail gunner. He flew 35 missions over Nazi-held Germany. And after we visited his old base, and we visited the base that I'd served at there back in the 70s, we went across that English Channel one more time. Halfway across, my dad looked up, and he said, 71. I said, what are you talking about, Dad? He says, it's my 71st trip across the English Channel. <laughs> Over and back 35 times on a B-17 and one more time. And we went to Normandy. And we visited that cemetery above the English Channel. And we stood above that extraordinary sight, that view, those thousands of graves, those crosses and stars of David. Interestingly, they all look west. Every one of them. West to America. West to America that they had left. Left to America that they were willing to defend to their death. To an America they would never return to. 
I happen to think today they look upon us in silent judgment. And today we need to ask ourselves, do we remain a nation worthy of their sacrifice? If we've learned the lessons of their generation, that evil must be confronted, that courage is the greatest weapon in the arsenal of free men and women, that America must always lead if we are to always be free. And I know the answer to that. The answer to that is an overwhelming yes, we will deliver this country back to the track and to the people that gave us this opportunity. The best days of this country are ahead of us. The best days of this world are ahead of us because we're going to make the right decisions and we're going to elect the right leader to lead this country forward as we go forward. God bless you and thank you all for letting me come and be a part of this today. Thank you, Eric. As an inventor, a serial entrepreneur, and writer, I believe I've come up with a solution to our immigration problem. Okay. Can I hand this to you? Sure. And, and tell me what you think. Um, Excuse me. If we, eliminate, if we eliminate the magnet, then the problem resolves itself. It's very simple. It costs zero dollars, and it will resolve itself very easily. All right, Thank well, you. Let, let's, let's, let's talk about this issue just a second, if you will. And, and not, not on the magnet side of it, but let's just say what I happen to see as a... I don't know if I'm... Can you go to the podium? Yeah, the great. <laughs> that may help a bit right there. The, the point with this is to have this, this, this country's got to be secured. I mean, it, it, when you look at the Constitution, the Constitution tells us a few things that the federal government's supposed to do. Stand a strong military and secure our borders are two of the most important things that are enumerated in the Constitution. And we've got to get back. I've I got to think that Steve King probably touched on this a little bit here about the rule of law and doing what the Constitution tells us to do. It, it gets right back to that issue about do we want the federal government telling us how to educate our children, how to build our transportation infrastructure, how to deliver our health care? And the answer is no. The states are going to be able to do that. But protecting and defending our border is a federal responsibility. That's the reason that last summer, when the President of the United States was in Dallas, now he was on a very important mission uh, because he couldn't come look at the border with me, I asked him to. I really wanted him to see because I think it would have been incredibly instructive for him to have come and seen the, the vastness, the challenge that we have in Texas on that border, particularly that southern region where over half of the apprehensions were occurring at that particular point in time. But he was busy. He had a very important mission, raising money for needy Democrats in Dallas. I get that. <laughs> but the point is, I told the president, I said, Mr. President, if you will not secure this border, Texas will. And that's exactly what we did. We deployed our National Guard. You can secure the border. I, I do not buy into the, those that say you just can't secure the border. Yes, you can. You must first have the will. And that will has to be exhibited from the highest office in this country. And at that particular point in time, a president that gives clear and unequivocal direction on how to do it 
And you do it with personnel. You do it with uh, having the strategic fencing in place, which we basically have. And the third thing, which is completely missing today, from my understanding, is the aviation assets, flying that 1,800-mile border, looking down, analyzing what's going on on both sides of the border, and having fast response teams to go direct when you see illegal activities occurring. At that particular point in time, you can secure the border, and that's what must happen before this country is ever going to have a conversation about immigration, because the American people do not trust Washington, D.C. to deal with the issue of immigration until the border is secure. <laughs> Got a minute? One minute. Yes, sir. Mr. Ambassador, how are you? Governor, great to see you back yes, in sir. the state of New Hampshire. Welcome back, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you. I just, you know, and it's great to see you feeling better again. <laughs> Healthy's good. Yeah. Many of us in this Two room. Two things I learned in 2011. Yes, Number sir. Number one is you got to spend a lot of time in New Hampshire, and you better be healthy, and you better spend, like, years here. <laughs> yes, sir. And now that you're not governor... Tell us a little bit about how your campaign's going to be different from last time around. Our family supported you. Many folks in this room yeah. supported you. Look, great to see you again. Let us know yeah, kind sure. of what are your, what are your new thoughts a, here. It was a good segue into uh, being healthy is really important. I had major back surgery in June, July of, uh, of 2011, six weeks later, you know, thinking I, I can do this. Broke my arm when I was a kid in high school. I was back playing in six weeks. What can be tougher than that, right? Well, there is something. You've got to be healthy. You've got to be on your game. But more importantly is the preparation side of this. And I will suggest to you that to be prepared to stand on the stage and talk about this myriad of issues, whether it's domestic policy, monetary policy, whether it's foreign policy, takes years of intense study. And I've spent the last three years in that, uh, in that mode, being able to stand up and discuss all of these issues and, 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 and do it in a way that is, is very profound and, and impactful and sitting down with from the Hoover Institute to the Brookings Institute and everything in between, whether it's AEI or whether it's uh, the Hay, and, I mean, all of those individuals sitting with Richard Fisher and Jim Ricards at the same table, which was rather interesting, uh, to talk monetary policy, all of those in that preparatory time. But with that said, I will suggest to you that the next president of the United States really needs to be someone who has deep, experience as an executive. And I'm talking about things that you can't just learn with a book, things that you can't just learn sitting down, because I'll give you some examples. They didn't hand me a manual and say, here's how you deal with a space shuttle disintegrating in your state. They didn't hand me a manual when Katrina came in to Louisiana, and there were literally hundreds of thousands of people that were displaced. They didn't hand me a manual when all of those people showed up on our border last year, or for that matter, when Ebola ended up on the shores of America in Dallas, Texas. That executive experience that you get from those years of work are invaluable. And I think that's what, uh, if I decide to run, the value that I'll be able to lay in front of the American people, not only a record that I will suggest I, I happen to think from a job creation standpoint, from an educational progress standpoint, from creating an environment where people are free, that is unquestionably the best that this country has at this particular point in time. And the fact is, if, if that is what Americans would like to see for the rest of this country, then that is, I think, where we need to have this conversation and talk about it in a civil and a thoughtful way that that executive experience is incredibly important to the next leader of this country. Because we've spent eight years with a young, inexperienced United States senator. And I will suggest to you, economically, militarily, and foreign policy-wise, we're paying a tremendous price. How are we on time there? Minute 30. Minute 30. I will be quicker. <laughs> yes, ma'am. She's coming. Governor, Mary Ann Turner, Enfield, Connecticut. A um, couple things. Common Core worries the hell out of me. 
Number two, when we talk about Obamacare getting out, we're going to get rid of it. We need to keep in mind that the insurance companies are pushed against the fence. Yes, they can't come back. And we need to talk about that. Great. And um, thank you for being here. Great. Uh, Common Core, Obamacare, I addressed those earlier when I talked about that the states are where those solutions are going to be. The, the old Supreme Court Justice, Louis Brandeis, a, a, a very liberal Supreme Court Justice, but he respected the Constitution. And he said the states were the laboratories of democracy. He said there they should be allowed to experiment, to come up with the different ideas on how best to do things and deliver things back to that constitutional, that Tenth Amendment uh, focus. And I agree with that. There are going to be some states that make mistakes, just as Brandeis said they would. But he said at least they don't destroy the republic. And I, I fear greatly that if Obamacare is left in, 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 its, in its form, it has the potential to destroy this country from access to health care. I, I know how to expand access to health care. We did it in my home state. We passed the most sweeping tort reform in the nation in 2003. And a decade after that was passed, there's over 35,000 more licensed physicians practicing medicine. That access to health care is not about forcing people to buy insurance. It's about putting thoughtful practices into place, and I will suggest to you that will happen in the states. It will not happen in Washington, D.C., and Common Core is every bit as problematic as Obamacare. God bless you, and thank you.